This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with mathematician Keith Devlin, author of The Unfinished Game, Pascal Fermat, and the 17th century letter that made the world modern. Keith Devlin is a consulting professor of mathematics at Stanford University, a World Economic Forum fellow, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the author of the Devlin's Angle column for the Mathematical Association of America, and NPR's Math Guy, among many other things indeed. His new book is The Unfinished Game, Pascal, Fermat, and the 17th Century Letter That Made the World Modern, A Tale of How Mathematics Is Really Done. Keith, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Colin. Now, this is, as I understand it, a, a, a book in the series from Basic Books entitled Basic Ideas, which uh, elucidates, we'll say, historical documents. Now, what is the document or are the series of documents you're dealing with here? Okay, if, uh, the book focuses on one document out of a small series of, uh, of letters that was written in, uh, in 1654 between one... Well, it was an exchange of letters between two famous French mathematicians, Pierre de Fermat, uh, known mostly these days for Fermat's Last Theorem, uh, and, and Blaise Pascal, known for Pascal's Triangle and various other things. So uh, during the summer of 1654, they exchanged a series of letters. We don't know quite how many letters. Uh, there were seven that survived to this day that we know of, and, and one in particular is the one that the book focuses on, and that's the letter that's generally acknowledged to be the foundation of modern probability theory and risk management and... and Everything that we used to think was wonderful in the world until the, the stock market and the mortgage crisis came upon <laughs> us a year and a half or two years ago. When you were given an opportunity to pick from mathematics a historical document of importance to write up, first of all, how wide a field are you choosing from? How many documents were floating around as possibilities for this? In fact, yeah, it was about three years ago, I think, that the then editor of this series, Bill Fucht, he's now left Basic Books, but he was the one, I think, that was, that was spearheading a lot of this work. He came to me at Stanford and asked me about this. And uh, because there are many, many documents and letters, thousands and thousands that have affected life on Earth, going back to Euclid's elements and so forth. But in terms of what he was looking for, only one came to mind because what he said, he wanted something sort of relatively short, something like, you know, the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, something that's relatively short and you can, and you can wrap around in a relatively short book. Uh, and something that directly impacted life on Earth. Now, most mathematics influences science, technology, medicine, so our lives are indeed impacted all the time by mathematics, but it's one or two steps removed. What, what, what BASIC was looking for was something that was easily identifiable and right there in your face impact that really changed life on Earth for, for ordinary people. And as he was talking to me, and I remember we were sitting on, on White Plaza out in the open air at Stanford University outside the bookstore, and as, as he was speaking, I mean, I think I interrupted him and said, there is one that I know about, and that's this, this letter from Pascal to Fermat that started probability theory. So Bill then comes back to me and says, well, okay, what's in it? And I said, well, I don't know. I've never read it. <laughs> uh, so he said, how do you know about it? I said, well... If you're in the business of mathematics, uh, and, you, and you, you, you go when you when I was at university and I learned, took a course on probability theory, at the beginning of the first lecture, the, 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 the lecturer came in and said, probability theory can be traced back to a letter written from Pascal to Fermat in, in the 17th century. So I knew about this letter. And then many years later, when I found myself teaching probability theory, I, I, t- I retold the same story. I do what all professors do. I, I told the stories that my professors told me when I was a student, and I repeated this story. <laughs> and it's part of the folklore of, of mathematics. Everyone who gives a course on probability theory has to mention I think it's like when people teach linguistics, they, they have to mention the, the Eskimo words for snow story. <laughs> now, unfortunately, that story is false. Right? The Eskimos actually don't have many words for snow. Right. But in the case of this one, it is the case that there really was this letter but I had never read it, and to the best of my knowledge, none of my professors had read it, and I don't think anyone had really read this letter. We just repeated the story that it went back then. So it is actually historically accurate, but nobody had bothered to look at it. And uh, finding myself faced with a, with, a, with a contract with basic books to write this, and I, I, it was clearly something that fitted the bill. In fact, it was the only one that immediately 
came to mind that would, would really fit the bill of having an immediate impact. And, and moreover, the mathematics should be something that ordinary people can wrap their mind around. I mean, most mathematics is, is way beyond the average readers. But calculating probabilities, and this is, is about calculating the outcomes of rolls of dice, that's, it's a little bit it's perplexing mathematics sometimes, but it's relatively simple. They're just elementary arithmetic arguments. And, they, and even now, three years later, I haven't thought of another topic I could have written on. This, I think, is the only one that really fits the bill. But having found myself with this contract, I had to go and read the letter. Uh, that turns out to be relatively easy these days with the web because you can just Google Pascal Fermat and you get the PDF file immediately on your computer. So within 24 hours, I had not only that letter, but most of the series of letters and, and a lot of information about it. And I started to read. And I was just knocked over. It just knocked my socks off. This isn't just a good story. This is one of the great stories of human civilization. And it's been sitting there since the 17th century, and nobody had bothered to look at it and figure it out. It's a huge story. It's absolutely huge. So not only was I pleased, but when I took the story to Bill, he said, this isn't just something that squeezes into this series. This is going to be one of our lead books in that series. And in fact, it was their lead title last year when it came out. It's a huge, huge story. I recall seeing references to Pascal and Fermat's development of probability theory in your previous books, uh, maybe one or two, I, I believe most recently in the, in, uh, the math, uh, math Instinct. And was this something that you would had in the back of your mind as a possible, I'm going to get into this deeper when I have a career reason to do it? Or No, it wasn't. I mean, it, I, I think it's a nice story. It's one of these things that people can latch on to. It adds a bit of human interest. You talk about two people writing letters and how mathematics is really done. So it's always a nice thing to throw away, but I didn't think it was that big a deal. I just thought, well, okay, it's probability theory started some time and so forth. But it, it was only when I read it, and in particular, when I read what people were saying just before this letter was written and what they were saying just after this letter was written, that was a sea change in human thinking. I mean, it was such a dramatic change that uh, the only two things I can compare it with where mathematics has had an enormous impact on everyone's lives is, first of all, when numbers were invented about uh, seven, 8,000 years ago. That was huge. Imagine life without... Oh, actually... These days, we cannot imagine life without numbers. We can't get through the first 10 minutes of the day without numbers. The alarm clock wakes us up, the telephone rings. Numbers, we look at our watches and so forth. Numbers are part of our everyday lives. We turn on the radio, we're inundated with numbers. We can't imagine life without numbers. And yet, you've only got to go back 8,000 years, and there were no numbers. So the introduction of numbers was one of these times when human life was changed fundamentally for everybody on the planet, uh, at least everyone in, in, in a sort of a civilized part of the planet, which is almost everyone these days, that changed so fundamentally that that was huge. The only other time where mathematics changed everyone's lives was really the scientific revolution, the idea, going back to Galileo and Bacon and people, that you can attach numbers to the world we live in, and you can talk about things like temperatures and lengths and, 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 and forces and accelerations and velocities and uh, pressures and all of the things we, we now use in our everyday vocabulary when we're talking about our daily life, things like force again and, and temperature, those things were essentially invented or they weren't even discovered. They were inventions. Temperature is an invention that was made in the, in the, I guess, 15th, 16th, 17th century around that time so that we could hang numbers on the world. And you know, what the scientific revolution was about was saying, we don't know why things happen in the world, but we can understand how they happen by assigning numbers to things and looking at the way numbers change and the relationships between numbers. Things like Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration, which relates three mathematical concepts. They're not even really physical concepts. Force, mass, and acceleration are numerical mathematical concepts that we hang on to phenomena in the world in order to understand it. That not only changed science and technology, the scientific revolution not only changed science and technology, it changed our very being. We talk every day in terms of things like forces and accelerations and temperatures. It's part of our everyday life. So there's those two occasions when mathematics changed everything. The first one being numbers itself, and the second one being figuring out how you could use numbers to understand the world we live in. And there's only one more time when that happened, to the best of my knowledge, and that was the probability theory one, which was, in fact, many, very, very much like scientific revolution, the way I think of the, of the invention of probability theory, at least the way I think about it having done the research for this book, 
was that what Pascal and Fermat showed was that just as a la Galileo, you can use numbers to understand the world we live in, so too you can use numbers to understand the world we will live in tomorrow or next week or next year or next century. In other words, you can use numbers to predict the future with almost as much accuracy, in, in, in fact, in its own terms, in exactly as much accuracy as Galileo showed that you can use numbers to understand the present. I'm going to break in here and say that the the concept of what a sea change all this was, what probability as discovered by Pascal and Fermat was versus what came before, that's going to be it's going to be harder to grasp for a reader or listener how probability was viewed before that than actually the mathematics itself. So what what was the idea of predicting the future like pre this exchange of letters? Yeah, and, I, and, I, and as I sort of alluded to a moment ago, it was the dramatic nature of that change and how quickly, and it all, everything changed within about 20 or 30 years. That's what makes this a great story. And it is actually now very difficult for us to put ourselves back at the time before this change happened. Exactly, and this is why it's the same as the invention of numbers and the scientific revolution. So great was the change that we actually find it almost impossible to put ourselves back into what it must have been like uh, on, on, let's say, Sunday, August the 24th, 1654, the day before this letter was written. I mean, I mean, I can say what it was like, but I can't put myself in that position. And what it was like was that people thought the future is literally in the hands of the gods. It's a matter of fate. There is nothing you can say about what might happen tomorrow. In fact, when mathematicians tried to think about these things, they said, if something is in the future the chances of it happening are 50-50. That's the only sensible number you can attach to something is 50-50 because it's, it's completely uh, hands of the gods, chance, fate, it's random. You cannot quantify whether something is more likely. This is very strange when you think about it because they did know on, on some level that some things were more likely than, than other things. I mean, you know, they knew that this, it was very likely the sun was going to rise tomorrow. So it wasn't that they thought that that, that things were completely random. It's just that when they tried to focus on, on, on assigning numbers to how an event might come out, they somehow didn't make that last step and say, well, you could actually quantify it. What they said was, well, no, it's literally a matter of fate, and there's no way you can sensibly attach numbers to them. So it's very difficult for us today, I think, to see how they failed to make the connection. They could calculate odds. They, since the 10th century, they knew you know, that if you roll a pair of, well, they, they knew elements of, of, of what happens when you roll a pair of dice, uh, you know, the chances of a double six is one over 36, that kind of thing. Those kind of calculations can be traced back to the 10th century. So, uh, and certainly by, by the 15th century, it was pretty well worked out how you calculate the odds for sort of rolling dice and that kind of thing. So they did know how to calculate odds. They also knew from their experience that some events are more likely than other events. But they didn't connect the two together until Fermat and Pascal entered this correspondence and showed that, by golly, you can connect the two. Now, to clarify a little of what the actual connection that was not made before these guys was, there was there was odds in people's minds. There were there were odds, but in people's minds, but there wasn't uh, there wasn't the idea that odds can be applied to the future, or there, there wasn't the idea that odds can be applied to things that aren't rolling One dice? One of the or... things about this book series was the, the, the authors, I mean, the, the, the authors of the book were asked to provide an interpretation of something, to actually sort of make it clear to people from a present-day perspective what the big deal was. So part of my job was, in fact, to provide an explanation of what was difficult. Now, it wasn't the mathematics per se, it wasn't the calculations. It's a very simple... In fact, the calculation that Fermat made and the actual solution that's the topic of this letter. It's a four or five line argument that can be taught now to, to kids in the middle and high, middle levels of the middle grades of the high school. So it's not a difficult calculation. The calculation is in the book. Anyone who reads the book, no matter what their mathematical background, shouldn't have any difficulty following it. It's simply elementary arithmetic. So the difficulty wasn't the mathematics. Uh, and let's remember that Pascal and Fermat, the two correspondents here, are two of the greatest mathematicians the world has ever seen. And uh, and one of them in particular, Pascal, one of the things that makes this fascinating is how Pascal struggles to understand this solution that Fermat uh, has suggested. So the problem clearly is not that they can't master the calculation. 
nor is it the idea that, 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 that these calculations can relate to the world. The only explanation I can give as to why this proves so difficult, and this problem had been around several hundred years, and, and, and mathematicians had been unable to solve it. My only interpretation, uh, and this remains the case today as it did two or three years ago when I started on the book, is that the whole issue was applying numbers to the future. They were mentally blocked, thinking it was an impossible. You know, one of the almost the only and the, certainly the biggest obstacle to making advances in mathematics, science, or many other walks of life is thinking you're trying to do the impossible. Once you regard something as impossible, it's remarkable how how, how tractable things become. Something prevented people from making this one key step. The only thing I can think of, and the only thing that I put in the book, is that it was the very idea of applying a scientific method, a mathematical method, a method of precision, to saying what might happen in the future. It's possible that religion was mixed up in this. Pascal, in particular, was a deeply religious. Actually, throughout his career, through his life, he, he, he oscillated between being extremely religious and then having periods of agnosticism. And it could well be that at the back of his mind, Pascal, and remember Pascal was the one that had the most difficulty with this argument, Pascal felt it was actually wrong to try and use mathematics to predict the future. The future, Pascal may have thought, the future is, is, God's, is, God's, is God's matter. It's not for a human, for a mortal, to try to foresee uh, how God may take things out. So it could be that religious belief was part of what prevented people from applying mathematics to the future. And if indeed you do think that the future is in the hand of, of a single deity, or as the Greeks did, the gods on Mount Olympus, and, and the Greeks, when they looked at probability theory, um, at least when they gambled, you know, they, they had all of these myths about the, uh, these beliefs about the gods on Mount Olympus. Actually, the gods rolling dice on Mount Olympus is an interesting analogy. So the whole religious background may, may be highly relevant uh, to why people felt you could not, and maybe should not, try to do mathematics to the future, that you would be stepping on, on God's realm and that that's, that's something mortals shouldn't be doing. Now, I don't know that's the case. I speculate about that a little bit in the book, but since I don't have any hard evidence for that, I don't make a big deal of it. Before we get into the actual unfinished game of the title, we should give a little background, a little more background, since you've already given some on the, the two great minds exchanging letters, these two 17th century Frenchmen, Pascal and Fermat. Now, you've said that Pascal was the more religious. In the book, you do emphasize that Fermat is the one who comes, the one who sees this problem a little more incisively, who sees things a little clearer, who gets to the result quicker, and Pascal is the one who struggles. What's the intellectual disparity between the two? Yeah, this is, this is really fascinating. And again, this is one of the aspects of this story that I had no idea about until I read it. Pascal was the one that sort of, was, he was told, Pascal was told the problem. I said it, 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 it had been around many years, and a gambler, uh, the Chevalier de Mere, a friend of Pascal had, uh, was interested in this. And so he told Pascal early in 1654, and Pascal himself, uh, already an established mathematician, and, and, and today we'd also call him a physicist, he tried to solve it, and he came up with an argument. It was a very complicated argument. In fact, it's extremely complicated. The one thing in the book that I think people will have difficulty following is Pascal's argument. Now, it, it, he didn't quite get it right, but you can make it correct. Uh, and I do give his arguments in the book, but that is the one part where I think, as a, I think I put a footnote saying, look, this is really difficult, you might want to skip this, and in any case, Pascal's argument is not the one that it, it ultimately swayed. But he did definitely have this very complicated argument to try and solve it, but he do a lot of problems with it. And it was when he couldn't sort of push it through to his own satisfaction, and even though the argument can be made to work, he was very uncertain as to whether it was a legitimate argument. I mean, that's already... I think many people will find that interesting, that a great mathematician can produce an argument and himself be unsure whether the argument's correct or not. That's very familiar to those of us in mathematics. We can, argue, we can produce a logical argument, a proof, but we ourselves might not be certain that it's correct or not. <laughs> uh, and that, that's, that's part and the parcel of, of doing original mathematics. So being uncertain, he writes to, to Fermat. He never met, by the way, the two never did meet. Uh, in, in the book, I, just, I do uh, refer to the attempts they made late in life to try and meet, but they never met. Pascal sends this letter to Fermat. Uh, we don't have that letter anymore. We do have Fermat's reply. In the reply, Fermat has basically solved the problem. Now, did it take him a day? Did it take him a week, a few I don't know how long it took him. But it was such a penetrating argument. It, 
instead of having this many pages of convoluted argument that Pascal had done, Fermat just saw immediately how to solve the problem by the means of an extremely simple argument, where you just look at the way the future might have turned out and, and, and count the possibilities. You say, it could have gone this way, that way, that way, and that way. You count how many ways it could have, the game could have, and we'll, we'll have to talk about the game in a minute. You count how many ways it could have, have turned out, and then you count the ones where one player wins and the other player. It's a simple counting argument. It's so simple that, as I mentioned earlier, you can, you can give this argument to, to middle school students. Uh, I present the argument in the book. In fact, a few years ago, I worked on a TV series, PBS series, Life by the Numbers, and we had no hesitation putting a depiction of this answer on screen for viewers. It, it, it's something so simple, you could do it on a television screen. You don't need to spend a lot of time reflecting on it. It's a simple, simple argument. The kind of argument people do all of the time today without thinking about it when we make random, you know, we make rapid calculations about the chances of rain tomorrow or over the weekend or how likely is it to rain over the, the, our vacation. The kind of calculations that are sort of part and parcel of everyday life. That was the kind of simple argument, counting argument, that Fermat came up with. And one of the points I, I think I make this clearly in the book, and I've certainly made it clear in, in many lectures I've given since writing the book, is that people often think that the essence of deep, good mathematics is a complicated argument that's difficult to follow. Nothing can be further from the truth. What mathematicians prize above everything else is a simple, straightforward argument that penetrates to the very heart of the problem. And that's what Pascal, what Fermat did. Pascal failed to do that. Pascal came up with a, a very complicated argument. But Fermat, all right to the heart of this issue, came up with the simple argument that solves it. Now, that, you would think, ought to have been the end of the matter. In fact, that's where it gets even more interesting, because he writes back to Pascal with this simple argument. And Pascal doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. Yeah, sure, he can follow it. It's a simple argument, and he's a great mathematician. But he can't believe that it works, and he struggles and struggles. And by the time we get to this big letter, the, uh, the, the, the Monday, August 25th, 1654 letter that I concentrate on the book, by the time we get to that letter, and the, which is you know, two or three letters into the correspondence, Pascal has got pages where he struggles to understand Fermat's argument. And that is truly fascinating, that even when a great mathematician is presented with a simple argument that definitely solves the problem and which certainly has survived to this day, that great mathematician himself can't extend it. He just can't accept it. He struggles with it and has all sorts of, of, of issues with it. And in fact, he shows Fermat's letter to some of his friends and they don't buy it either. This is why we can recognize Fermat has been great because Fermat comes up with this simple argument that solves the problem. And Pascal... And some of Pascal's great mathematician colleagues, it's so radical for them that they can't grasp it. Uh, they can't sort of understand that it really does work. On one level, they can see it works because it's logically sound. But they just don't buy that it solves the problem. And they keep looking for hidden mistakes. Uh, and there aren't any mistakes. So would you say that Pascal and his local friends found it not so much invalid as implausible? Yeah, I think that's a very good way of summarizing it. They, they had to have recognized its validity. It's, it's, quite, it's so simple that you have to recognize its validity. But they, it seems so implausible to them, so counterintuitive. It's so much so different from the kind of thing that they've ever seen before that they think there has to be some problem that they're missing. And Pascal struggles to see what this problem is. And, of course, he can't find it because there isn't one. And it's really a matter of, of coming to terms with the way things are. You know, he, he, he'd grown up in a worldview that said the future is unpredictable. And suddenly he's presented with this extremely simple little piece of arithmetic that does predict the future. And, you know, it, it's, it's a struggle between what you can see with your logical mind and what all of your experiences, your education, and your beliefs tell you can be done. And those two were suddenly at odds. Now, it didn't take long before the world changed. And this is why it's a dramatic revolution. The argument was so simple that once people bought into the idea that you could use numbers to predict the future, things happened rapidly. In fact, within, within two or three decades, we have on the scene insurance industries, risk management, futures predictions, 
we have in place everything that we take for granted about managing the risks of life in order to do things uh, that, that, that would otherwise be, be, be restricted to the foolhardy or the extremely rich. At this point, we should get into the nature of the unfinished game itself. Now, what is what are the specifics of the problem that has so enchanted uh, Pascal and Fermat? Okay, so it's a simple little argument about... A, it's called the unfinished game. It's also sometimes called the problem of the points. And so it, it goes back to... Well, we, we don't know quite when it began. There was, a, uh, there was a book written in the late 15th century, I think it was 1494 or thereabouts, by uh, Luca Pacioli, uh, an Italian mathematician contemporary and a colleague of Leonardo da Vinci, in fact. And he states the problem in, the, in his book, but we know it for sure that it goes back before then. And, and here it is in a simple form. You've got two gamblers uh, rolling a pair of dice, and they decide they're going to have a tournament to see who wins the best of five rolls. So best of five, so you know, one person's going to get three, the other one will get two, or something like that. So there's a best of five rolls. They start to roll, and they put money into the pot. After they've Rolled, let's say, three dice. So they've, rolled, they've, 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 they've had three rolls of the dice. The game is interrupted. They've had to stop the game before it's finished. Now, they'd agreed to play the best of five, but they've only played three rounds, and let's assume that one of them is ahead two to one. The question is, how should they divide the pot in a way that's fair, reflecting the fact that one player is ahead two to one? Now, of course, the player that's ahead two to one isn't necessarily going to win because the other player could win the last two rounds, and then he loses two to three. So simply being ahead two to one doesn't guarantee that you're going to win. But to modernize, it does suggest that you're more likely to win if you're ahead two to one. We would today say that that gives you an edge. Now, back before this letter was written, people didn't see things that way. And in fact, they thought this was a very difficult problem. So the problem is, how do you fairly divide the pot when the game has had to be abandoned before it's, it, it, it's clear who's going to win? That's why it's called the unfinished game. So it's an issue of fair division. Uh, these days there are lots of other problems to do with fair division, but this was one of the first ones. Uh, and, and in particular, this was about division, about something that had been uncompleted. As I said, this, this, uh, this problem had been around a couple of hundred years. It, it wasn't a terribly important one in the gambling community. If games are unfinished, who knows what you do? People just decide on something. It was one of these, you know, one can imagine that gamblers, and because there was a lot of gambling going on in Europe at that time, uh, in fact, many of the mathematicians at the time made a good side living, uh, and in some cases their primary source of income, by being essentially consultants to wealthy noblemen to try and help them to improve their lot, their, their chances at the gaming rooms. So one of the ways mathematicians fund themselves today that some mathematicians find is not very reputable is to get defense department funding. Well, back then, uh, one of the ways mathematicians could fund their work was by, by getting sponsorship from gamblers, from gambling noblemen to try and help them win at the gaming tables. The problem itself was, one can imagine, that, that gamblers might ch talk about this in between rolling dice. You know, it's a sort of a hypothetical what-if thing, because after all, the essence of gambling is you actually do complete the game, and, and, you, and the idea is to improve your winnings. So this was a sort of a hypothetical. It wasn't a terribly important problem in of itself, but it, was, it, it sort of gathered interest because people couldn't figure out how to solve it. In fact, if you read... What people said about this problem before Pascal and Fermat got into the picture, many mathematicians said, you cannot provide an answer to this question. There is no way you can say with any precision how you should divide the pot of an unfinished game because it's to do with the future. The game itself was not played out. Therefore, there's no way that mathematics can be used. So there was this general consensus that, in fact, there wasn't any way of doing it. The only answer that people came up with was the following. They said, look, we don't know how the game would have finished. So the only fair thing to do is to split the pot 50-50. It could have gone one way, it could have gone another way. And so insofar as people tried to give an answer, they would say that it was a 50-50 split. If they didn't come up with that, they would say, well, there is just no way that mathematics can be applied. So that, that's the history of the problem of what you would do to apportion the pot fairly when the game has had to be abandoned. What further intrigued these two about the issue? When, it, when the, I don't know if I want to call it a consensus, but when the idea was that you would do the 50-50 split and call it good, what, what then sparked Fermat and Pascal's interest? The, the answer for Fermat, I think, is going to be very simple. So let me deal with Pascal first. I mean, it, you know, he's a, to the best of my knowledge, he hadn't really come... Pascal did have various periods when he himself was a gambler, 
in between these periods have been deeply religious. <laughs> uh, he had periods where, by the way, his religious beliefs were so strict at some stage that he had to give up mathematics because it was felt that mathematics was the work of the devil. Um, we tend not to think that these days, but certainly <laughs> his religious periods were also marked by, by abandoning mathematics. Uh, fortunately for history, that he, he did keep coming back to mathematics. But to the best of my knowledge, he, didn't, he wasn't aware of this problem until his friend told, told, told him about it. And so he comes upon it fresh. He, he, he most likely had never read any of the, of the works from earlier writers who said that they thought it was impossible. So he's got this problem, and it's an intriguing problem. And he was sufficiently intrigued to try and solve it. And as I mentioned, he came up with this very convoluted argument that he, thinks, he thought that it would solve it, um, and in fact can be made to solve it. But it's an argument with a lot of problems to it. And I think at that point, he was just puzzled that such a simple question seemed so intractable. Explicitly, he didn't think it was impossible, because in fact, he did come up with an argument. So the remarks I made earlier about why didn't he quite see how to do it, I think were, uh, you know, I, 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 I mentioned that I thought it might be because of religious beliefs or just a sense that it was impossible. Uh, that, I think, was probably at the back of his mind, the feeling that there was something not quite right about this. And certainly when he sees Fermat's argument, he has trouble understanding it. But on the face of it, I, I, I think it's, it's not difficult to see, as, at least as a mathematician, why he would be intrigued by this and want to give it a shot. But then when he sees that this simple problem seems so intractable and, so, and requires such a complicated argument to solve, an argument indeed that he's not sure is correct, then he's hooked. I mean, this is what makes people like myself a mathematician. If someone asks us a simple question, and it proves difficult to answer, and we can make some progress, but we can't quite, quite get through to the answer, then it's hard to drop it. And at that point, I think he would be almost certainly, as a mathematician, he would want to know how to do it. And so that would have provided him the impetus uh, to write to Fermat, which he did on, on the advice of some colleagues. Then the letter comes back from Fermat that solves it with a very simple argument. Uh, and that's, in, in, in a sense, where the fun starts, where, where we read in the letter how, um, how Pascal struggles to understand Fermat's argument and struggles to try to, to see what's wrong, if anything, with his own argument. If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio. At colinmarshallradio.com, you'll find our complete interview archive, other podcasts, and more. My guest is mathematician Keith Devlin, author of The Unfinished Game, Pascal, Fermat, and the 17th century letter that made the world modern. And what does Fermat say about how to solve this? Here's what he says. He says, you, you've got the, we're playing a best of five rounds. Uh, one player is ahead two to one. Now, there are two more rounds to play. So the idea was that we're going to play five rounds. And you sort of say, well, what could happen in those two final rounds? Well, player A could win the first one and then the last one. Or A could win one and then B could win one. Or B could win and A could win. Or B could win them both. So you've got A could win them both, B could win them both, a and B or B and A. So there's four different possibilities of the way the game could, con could finish. If you count out of those four and say, well, out of those four, how many ways can the player who's ahead two to one win? Well, he can win three out of those four ways. So the players, the game had four possible ways of playing out. The player who's ahead when they abandon would win in three out of those four ways. Therefore, the chances that that player wins it's three out of four. We think that's so simple today, hearing it, but what raised the question mark over Pascal's head about that? <laughs> yeah, here was what the rub is. At least the real problem, I think, was just general beliefs. But here was the, here was the problem that, that was sort of focused on when we look at the letter, at least when we read the letter today. What did I just say? I said there are four ways the game could play out. One, uh, the player who's ahead could win two to one, uh, could win the next two rounds. But wait a minute, people would say, and Pascal and Pascal's colleagues did say this. He said, look, if the player who's two ahead wins the next round, then that player has won three rounds. So they would never play the fifth round because when you've won three rounds, you've won the best out of five. So they said, wait a minute, when Pascal says there are four different ways the game could finish, that's not true. Because if the player who's ahead two to one wins one, then they never play the last round. So it doesn't matter whether the fifth round is won by the first player or the second player. It would never be played. Therefore, they said, Fermat's counting argument is invalid because he's counting things 
that would never have happened. Now, it turns out, when, with, from today's perspective, knowing how these things work, Fermat was absolutely right. You have to count all the ways the, the game could have been played out, even if you know in principle that players would abandon. But that's quite sophisticated, because remember, what we're trying to do is apply numbers to the world. Now, are we applying them to the world as it actually would have been, or are we applying it to the world as it would have been if the players had been very anal retentive and insisted on continuing the four, the four <laughs> rounds? This issue doesn't arise in, 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 in Galileo's work, because Galileo, remember, was applying numbers to the world as it is. And so there's no question about how the things are that you're applying numbers to. But when you're counting the future, what future are you counting? Are you counting the future as it might have played out if the players were, as I, as I, as I said, anal retentive and insisted on playing five rounds, uh, even though you don't need to? Or are you counting the future as it almost certainly would have played out if real rational people had done it? It turns out that the way to get the mathematics to work correctly is to adopt the anal retentive approach and say, no, it's a best of five rounds. You have to look out of how it might have played out in all, all possibilities when you place the five rounds. Today, we're used to that kind of argument, but back then, that was novel. And so the issue was really not whether the counting is correct. The issue was, what is it you're counting? And Fermat's in insight was in recognizing what it is that you have to count. How correct would it be to say that Pascal failed to abstract the problem enough and um, thus skewed his probabilities in the wrong direction? The issue is you've got the problem, and, and it's, it's what we now call mathematical modeling. How do you model in, in, in a mathematical framework what people are doing in the real world? And in this case, it turns out you have to model discounting what, what ordinary human beings would do. The fact that people are smart and recognize that when you've won three out of five, you've won the best out of five. You don't need to play the fifth round. Actually, let me paraphrase that another way, because I think this, this is another way of looking at the same thing. I, I described the problem as the best out of five. I could have described the problem as first one to win three. Now, we know today that the best out of five is won by the player who gets to three first. But back at that time, and, and we think there's no big deal about that, Best out of five is the same as the first one that wins three. But there's, there, logically, those are different issues. And back in the 17th century, before Fermat came on the scene, people didn't recognize that those two were... were, were they didn't recognize the importance of the distinction between those two. And there is a distinction. Best out of five is not actually the same logically as the first to three. They're logically different, and it was important that what was key to the solution for Fermat was recognizing the distinction between those two. Whether he explicitly did that, I, I'm not sure, because I think what he really did was just see how to solve the problem. But that is a way of understanding the problem. So in that sense, yes, the issue is abstracting the problem. And it's important to abstract the problem as the best out of five rounds which are played to completion, rather than to think of the problem as the first of three. You can actually solve the problem directly if you pose it as the first of three, but the mathematics then gets more complicated. Although people would regard that as simpler, because first to three, you just keep playing until one person's won three, and then you don't waste your time playing any games you don't need to. That to us is simpler, but it turns out that if you apply the mathematics directly to work out the odds if it's formulated as first to three, uh, it's more complicated mathematics. It involves something called conditional probabilities, which didn't come on the scene until quite a bit later, and which most people today still find extremely difficult to come to terms with. This sounds a little bit like if we think back to our elementary school years and getting a word problem in our math books that tells us to you know, find the find the area of fa Farmer Brown's farm, and then we, we don't abstract in the right way, and so we think, well, no, a farm doesn't, isn't actually a square. It's, it's like this, and we, we get the wrong answer because of it. Yeah, no, this actually is one of the, the... I mean, teachers of and educators and math education people continually argue about the benefits of word problems. And word... These word problems, these story problems, go back to uh, the beginnings of mathematics. You can find them in ancient Sanskrit texts from the BCE era. I mean, these, these problems go back for, for many years. In fact, 
you know, much of the stimulus for developing mathematics was to solve real-world problems. In fact, arguably, all of the stimulus always has been to solve, ultimately, to solve real-world problems. So the ability to take a problem in the world and abstract it mathematically is key to using mathematics in the world. But it is a very, very difficult task. And, and there are choices to be made. And uh, the idea of these word problems, many of which are extremely silly. I mean, people don't make <laughs> calculations about trains leaving railroad stations. Uh, these days, we just go online and we find out when the train's due to arrive. And, and so we don't do these calculations. Nobody ever did. The idea of those problems, really, was to try and develop an ability in people to take a, a, a real-world situation. And real-world situations are always, by their nature, extremely complicated. You can never stop asking questions about how things might and might not happen in the real world. The essence of, of, of doing mathematics and the idea behind word problems is to say, look, do you have the ability, can you develop the ability that given a, a, an inherently complicated real world situation to abstract the key three or four features that you would need in order to, play, to apply mathematics? And, you know, mathematics works by, you know, most people think mathematics is unbelievably complicated and difficult. In fact, that's the opposite. What mathematics is, is the ultimate simplicity. What mathematicians do is they take the complex world we live in and they reduce it to four or five very simple parameters, some key numerical ideas, and then they argue with, uh, around those. And that step from the complex, of the, the complex real world to the simple sort of equations that we set up in mathematics is actually a very difficult one. It's much more difficult than then doing the math. When people talk about doing the math, they usually mean doing the actual calculations or solving the equations and so forth. That's actually the easy part, the hard part. Uh, as you just mentioned, really, was just was going from the real world situation to that mathematical formulation in the first place, and that was an, another way of looking at what it was that Fermat did. Fermat, when he solved this problem, saw the best way, and it definitely is the best way. Now, this is hundreds of years later, where we can still there's no better way to see it. Saw the best way to look at this problem mathematically in order to be able to do the math and solve it. And so, if we take Fermat's insight. I'll, I'll ask this. What sort of intellectual work was needed to, as you put it in the book, bring this insight out of the gaming room into the rest of the world? Uh, in some ways, it was extremely easy because everything was already in place. The mathematics wasn't terribly deep, and what mathematics was, was required had already been worked out. I mentioned that earlier that, that mathematicians had known for hundreds of years how to calculate odds. There was a, one of the most fascinating characters in the book, I think, is a, another Italian called Girolamo. Actually, I've only mentioned the French people, Pascal and Fermat, but there were several Italians in the story. This is essentially an Italian-French story, and uh, with a little bit of English influence uh, in the earlier days. But uh, Girolamo Cardano, who preceded, uh, preceded both of them by a century or more, he'd already come along and worked out the, the method for calculating odds when you roll two dice or three dice and so forth. He'd worked out what we now call the multiplicative rule for probabilities and complementary rules and so forth. He'd, he'd worked out what we now call the calculus of probability theory. He knew how to calculate odds and combine probabilities. That was all in place. Once the letter is written and people realize that you can apply those methods of Cardano, not just in the gaming rooms where they were designed to be used, but to predict the future of events, then things happened very, very quickly. Uh, in, in, in fact, it, 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 was, it was unbelievably quickly. Let me see. I guess it was, you've got Christian Huygens, who's known today for sort of all sorts of things in physics and optics and telescopes and so forth. Three years later, from 1654, it was only, it was 1657, just three years after this letter written, that Christian Huygens, Christian Huygens publishes a book, which is essentially a modern book on probability theory. So the, the way we teach probability theory to students today it's pretty well all in a book that was written just three years after this letter was written. Once the obstacle had been removed, once people realized you could apply these methods that already existed to predict how the future might turn out, then it happened very, very quickly. As I said, with, within three years, you've got a modern probability theory book been, been, been produced. A few years later, you've got a whole group of other mathematicians, including one or two of the Bernoulli family, showing how you can apply probability theory in the law courts, in business, to raise money, buy annuities, uh, insurance companies come along. Uh, everything that we now associate with risk management and futures predictions came within 30 or 40 years of this letter been written. 
because there was no more intellectual obstacle. The, the mathematics was and remains relatively straightforward and simple, although the psychological reason is counterintuitive in many cases. But being already in place meant that once people realized you could apply it to predict the future, they did. And, and boy, they did it in spades. You've got <laughs> things happening so fast and on such a broad scale. Uh, there have been few revolutions in human... I mean, I mentioned the, the invention of numbers. Numbers, I think, took centuries before they really affected people uh, on a large scale. Uh, in the scientific revolution, it didn't really impact people directly for many centuries. I mean, it, it affected their environment as science and technology developed, but it didn't get into the way they viewed the world. And yet, in the case of this revolution with the probability theory, within a few decades, people took it for granted that the future was predictable, that you could assign odds, you could buy insurance, you could take out annuities, uh, you, could, you could do all of the things we take for granted today to mitigate risks and to insure against them. That was within three or four, not centuries, but just three or four decades, that people just accepted that as a way of life. Just as today, we accept uh, the Internet and the mobile phone, they're just part and parcel of life. You know, we know we can, you and I can talk no matter where we are on the face of the earth almost, just by dialing up, putting a few numbers into a mobile phone. We take it as a, as, as a way of life that we can keep in touch with each other. We take it as a way of life that we can travel around the globe in, a, in at most 24 hours on an airplane. There's things we simply take for granted today. Well, go back to the 17th century. That was when people learned that they could take for granted the fact that you could offset risks about the future by relying upon other people's business of providing you with insurance. So you have a whole new business model beginning. You've got a whole group of people who then make money helping to manage your risks and to offset your risks with insurance and the like. So it's a huge revolution. It's something we now take for granted, and our ancestors learned to take that for granted within a few decades of this letter being written. That's a scale of transformation of human psyche and the, and the way we think about the world on as massive a scale as you're ever likely to see, and on an unbelievably r rapid scale of transfer. I mean, it was very fast how that happened, especially given that this was a time when there wasn't mass, mass communications. This, had, this all had to be spread by, by, by physical books and by word of mouth. But it was such a big idea that even in, a, in an era when it was difficult getting ideas out, it happened within a few decades. Now, you've made this incredible story of the development of modern probability theory into a, a popular book, a book for a general audience. And as we said, this is not your first book of mathematics or mathematics information or mathematics history for the general reader. Why is it so important to you to write books for the non-specialist about mathematics? <laughs> I think it really goes back to my own childhood. I, 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 I grew up in a fairly ordinary family in, in the north of England, what we'd now call, a, in English terms, a working-class family, you know, my and my parents didn't. Actually, my mother graduated from high school. My father didn't. And no one had gone to college in the family. And I, so I, and, and none of them, I grew up in an area where people didn't accept college. And, and I just stumbled as a teenager. Well, well as a whole bunch of things happened. I, I was originally motivated into science by Sputnik. The year I was about to go from, from elementary school to middle school in England when I was 11 uh, was the year I was 10 when Sputnik went up, the, the, the first satellite in space. And, and that inspired me to sort of think about science and then becoming a scientist for a career. I was never very good at mathematics at school, but I, I was motivated by Sputnik. You know, I was, I was a, as a kid, I was a keen science fiction fan. Uh, when Sputnik went up, that, that was really excited me. And I, I, I thought, well, boy, I'd, I'd like to become a scientist. And you know, I didn't have any scientists to talk to, or indeed people had gone to university. But I, 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 I sort of started to teach myself as well. And I bought, there weren't many popular books on mathematics and science around back in, in, in those days. This was the late 50s. I, I started to buy them, the sort of cheap paperback books of, of popular science books. Uh, and it was through those books that I learned that mathematics was much more than the, what I thought was the, the dull drudgery that I was going through in the classroom. The mathematics we teach, at least through the upper levels of high school, is inescapably dull drudgery. There's no alternative to it. It's like learning a language. You know, it's really cool. Uh, I, I travel to Italy and France a lot, and I, my Italian is not bad. And I find it really cool to be able to go to Italy and speak Italian. But that didn't make learning Italian any more fun. I mean, learning Italian in the early days was dull drudgery because you had to get sufficiently good at Italian to be able to use it in Italy to have fun with it. And it's the same with mathematics. If you're learning mathematics, 
you've got to learn enough of it. And then it, it really is a language you're learning. You've got to learn enough of that language before you can start to have fun with it. And most of the time in the schools, at least up through the upper levels of high school, are spent learning the nuts and bolts of that language. And that's, in the, that's unavoidably, most people find that dull, and I certainly did. But by reading popular books on mathematics and science, and it was initially books on science, and then I, I got sucked in and accidentally, I guess, started reading popular books on mathematics, that showed me the things that could be done with this stuff that I was learning in the school. And when I realized the, the, what was available to me if I pursued this, uh, this idea and persevered with my mathematics and science, then that really turned me on. I was just excited by the fact that uh, there was all of this really cool stuff that you could do with this mathematics and science. And so it, it was the fact that I was having to self-teach and self-motivate myself by reading popular books that really turned, turned me on. I mean, I've never forgotten that, that period of transformation. It was a, it was a real awakening uh, in me of, of what life was about and what I could do with my life. And I've always wanted to just provide the next generation of people, the next generation of students with the same ability. The, the reader I always have in mind when I'm writing popular books is essentially an updated version of myself uh, when I was 15, 16, or 17. So I'm always writing for an inquisitive 15, 16 year old boy or girl who knows a little bit of stuff is perhaps thinking they should maybe drop math because it's getting too boring. And I'd like to just show them what you can do if you just persevere a few more years and show them the really cool, neat stuff that can be done. So it's a sense of, of giving back to others what I, uh, what I benefited from when I was that age. And I wonder, so many subjects taught in primary and secondary school are regarded as drudgery, kind of no matter what the subject. Why does math get an especially bad rap? It seems to get, you know, if, I, if someone who's 40 years old say they're, they're learning a new language, people say, cool. If they say they're learning some more math, they say, why are you doing that? The trouble is, it's easy to explain to people, I think, at least for me, it's easy to motivate people about learning a language. You can say, look, it's really neat to go to Italy and hang around in Tuscany or to go to France and... and, and, and and, it, and if you can speak some of the language, it's much more fun. You can enjoy yourself more. You might go and live there for a period. So it's not, it's not difficult to see the kind of things you could do if you learn a language. Even in science, you can say, look, and this is how I got hooked. Remember, I got hooked by space travel. I wanted to be part of the space program. I thought if I learned enough science, I could you know, maybe get involved in spaceships or, or satellites and things. I mean, back then when Sputnik went in, people immediately thought about human space flight, and in fact, it wasn't that long before we had, uh, we had Neil Armstrong on the moon. So it wasn't an unrealistic dream. So I could see the outcome. And so that motivated me to learn physics. Remember, I started learning science before I started learning the mathematics. I learned the mathematics because I needed it for the science. But I could see the end point of learning science. I was going to be a space scientist. I mean, I didn't know whether I was going to be an astronaut, but I thought I'd be one of the team that put astronauts out there. And that was a really cool idea. But mathematics, it's very difficult to see the end point because in all of those other realms, like going to Italy and speaking Italian or becoming a space scientist and using the science, you can see the end point because the end point is in the world we're living in. Italy really exists. Spacecraft really exists. Mathematics creates the world in which it operates. The world of mathematics is a human creation. So you actually can't see the mathematics you'll be doing. You can't see that mathematical world until you've learned the mathematics. That means you, you're, you're lacking this ability to truly visualize what you're going to do. When I, was, I said, when I was learning the mathematics, I saw myself using it as a scientist. But that's different from what actually happened. Once I'd learned enough mathematics, I thought, hey, the world of mathematics itself is sufficiently interesting. In fact, to me, I found it more interesting than the world of physics that I was going to apply the mathematics to. I've, I've always remained interested in physics and engineering and, and chemistry and, and biology. I've, I've remained interested in those things. I read popular books on those things, all, on those subjects all the time. But I discovered that the world of mathematics, at least for me, was more interesting in itself than all of the applications. But I didn't know what that world was like until I'd learned a lot of mathematics. So I think the problem with mathematics is that you don't know what exactly you're going to be doing with it until you've learned a lot of it. Whereas with all the other subjects, you can imagine what you might do with it. Your imaginations are often wrong. You learn that, 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 that 
that the science isn't quite what you thought it was going to be. Um, but at least you can have that image in mind. And in mathematics, that's not there. What then is most challenging about showing people that world in your popular books, about showing them what is really what math really is? Oh, that's a matter of coming up with the right metaphors. You've got to sort of provide powerful visual metaphors of what you're doing. It's something I've always found relatively easy, but I know from talking to my colleagues that they find it very difficult. And in fact, there are very few of us who've been at all successful in writing popular books on mathematics. There's maybe a dozen of us around the world. Um, and and you know, interestingly enough, about a half of us were born in the United Kingdom, so I don't know what that <laughs> tells you, if anything. But for whatever reason, it seems I've, I was born with this ability to come up with these very powerful visual metaphors that help lay people, non-mathematicians, see what it is that mathematicians do. I don't know what it is, because I've always been able to do it, but as I say, I knew that, that very few people seem able to do it, and, and it's fortunate that some of us can do it, I think. But it is a matter of, of, of just providing those images, those metaphors, those, those visual pictures that people can latch onto in order to get a glimpse of, of, of what it is that mathematicians do. It was what the authors of the books that I read when I was young, it's what they were able to do. They were able to give me, although at the time I didn't know what mathematics was, give me a sense of what it was. And that's what I try to do, to just explain things in a way that can make it possible to understand. Now, that involves, in a sense, telling lots of white lies, because the mathematics is inherently almost always complicated. The, the topic of the unfinished game is actually unusual, because the mathematics itself can be understood. That was, that was a special case, but most of the stuff I write about in popular books, I have to tell lots of white lies to give the idea, to paint the picture of what the mathematicians do, without going down into the rather complicated details of what they actually do do. The current book, once again, is The Unfinished Game, Pascal Fermat, and the 17th century letter that made the world modern. Keith, thanks so much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure, Colin. Find out more about Keith Devlin at stanford.edu slash tilde kdevlin. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Check out more of his work at benalthaus.com. For our complete interview archive, other podcasts, and more, visit colinmarshallradio.com. <laughs>